The year was 1955, and we're in France, but not for war or a revolution. We're here for Le Mans, the ultimate test of speed and endurance in motorsports. For 24 hours, the best drivers and teams from around the world would race on a public road course that combined fast straights and tight corners. It was a spectacle that attracted millions of fans and a challenge that demanded skill, strategy and reliability. But on June the 11th, 1955, Le Mans became the scene of a tragedy that shocked the world and changed motorsports forever. Today, we will explore what happened on that fateful day and why it still resonates today as a reminder of the dangers and challenges of motorsports. The Circuit de la Sarthe is a semi-permanent motorsports race course located in Le Mans, France. It includes both public roads used throughout the year and private sections exclusively reserved for competition. The track spans approximately 13.6 kilometers or 8.5 miles. It features one of the longest straight sections in any motor racing event at that time, measuring in 6 kilometers or 3.7 miles in length. This allowed drivers to reach remarkable speeds, resulting in exhilarating races. Since 1923, the 24-hour of Le Mans race has taken place annually, with exceptions for wars and general strikes. As the world's most prestigious endurance race, it tested not only speed, but also efficiency, reliability, and teamwork. In 1955, prominent teams like Ferrari, Jaguar, and Mercedes-Benz participated. And with only a decade since the end of World War II, the event was dubbed World War II on the tracks by many media outlets. Around 300,000 spectators gathered along the course to witness the cars traveling at speeds of up to 270 kilometers per hour, or 168 miles per hour. However, the track was not designed for such high speeds, as its layout was established in the 1920s. Since then, automotive technology had advanced and race cars' top speeds had nearly doubled. Unfortunately, safety features had not kept up to pace with these developments. Drivers often didn't even wear their seatbelts, believing it was safer to be ejected from the vehicle in the case of an accident. Spectators were frequently separated from the track by only a ditch, a low earth mound, or a flimsy wooden or wire fence, very unlike motorsports of today. Le Mans in 1955 was a clash of titans, Three major automakers brought their newest and improved cars to compete for victory. Ferrari, Jaguar, and Mercedes-Benz. All three had won the race before, and had some of the best drivers in their lineups, including Fangio, Sterling Moss, and Mike Hawthorne, to name a few. Ferrari had the advantage of speed, but also suffered from frequent mechanical failures, not unlike the current Ferrari in Australia. Stupid. Their new 735 LM had a straight six engine derived from their Formula One car. It produced 360 horsepower, but it was also prone to overheating and breaking down. Jaguar had a very experienced driver lineup, including Formula One star Mike Hawthorne, who had a personal grudge against Mercedes Benz. Their sleek D type had state of the art disc brakes that gave it superior braking power than the other cars, but it was also heavier and less aerodynamic than its rivals, even though it looked beautiful. Mercedes Benz had dominated Formula One with their powerful W196 which shared a lot with their entry for Le Mans, the 300 SLR. This car featured a lightweight magnesium alloy body and an air brake that could be raised to slow down the car. But the 300 SLR also had some drawbacks, such as the inboard drum brakes that were prone to overheating and brake fade. The stage was set for an epic battle between these three rivals, but no one could have predicted what happened and the horror that would unfold on June the 11th in 1955. The race started like any other Le Mans race. It started at 4pm on Saturday the 11th of June with a traditional start, where the drivers ran across the track to their cars. The Mercedes-Benz team took an early lead with Fangio and Moss setting a blistering pace. The Ferraris tried to keep up, but soon suffered from various problems such as overheating, clutch failure and gearbox issues. The Jaguars were more conservative, saving their brakes and tyres for the later stages of the race. By 6pm, only two Ferraris remained in contention, while the Jaguars were closing the gap with the Mercedes-Benz. During the 35th lap, a catastrophic event unfolded. As Fangio and Hawthorne engaged in a fierce battle for the lead, they had lapped almost every driver at this point. Hawthorne, driving a Jaguar, decided to pit following his team's instructions from the previous lap. As he approached the pit, Hawthorne overtook British driver Lance Macklin's Austin Healey on the right side of the track. He then swiftly cut across to the left towards the pits, braking hard for his pit stop. Equipped with his more advanced disc brakes, which was a new technology at the time, Hawthorne's Jaguar could stop much faster than the other cars. Macklin, driving the Austin Healey, was caught off guard by the sudden deceleration and tried to avoid colliding with Hawthorne's Jaguar by veering off the track to the right. This caused him to seemingly lose control of his car before he moved back to the left in an attempt to regain it. This maneuver put Macklin's Austin directly in the path of Levy, who was traveling at over 240 kilometers an hour or 150 miles per hour. With no time to react and going way too fast, Levy crashed into the rear of Macklin's car, sending both vehicles flying into the air. Levy's Mercedes soared into the air and catapulted off the track, colliding with an embankment and breaking apart. Levy himself was thrown back onto the track where he died instantly. Debris, including the car's engine block, flew through the crowd and the nearby ground stand. The vehicle's bonnet sliced through spectators for 100 meters, causing many horrific injuries. 
The rear of the car also burst into flames, with the magnesium alloy intensifying the fire. Due to the experimental magnesium alloy, the fire burned a bright white and it was extremely difficult to extinguish. When water was used to try and put out the fire, it simply acted as fuel and simply magnified the blaze. It took hours to put this fire out. Macklin's Austin Healy spun several times and came to a rest near the pit lane. Macklin miraculously survived with only minor injuries. Carnage reigned supreme. In addition to Levy, 83 spectators perished and hundreds were injured. Hawthorne, who had overshot the pits, returned the lap later with tears streaming down his face. In the stands, people used advertising banners to transport the injured and deceased, while others frantically searched for loved ones and priests administered their last rites. Yet, inexplicably and perhaps unforgivably, the race did continue. American Formula One driver John Fitch, Levy's co-driver, who was standing with the Frenchman's wife during the incident, urged Mercedes to withdraw from the race. He argued that the PR disaster for a German manufacturer appearing indifferent about French bloodshed would be catastrophic just 10 years after World War II. However, the decision required approval from the highest level, and clearance to retire from the race was only granted after all of the company's directors had been contacted and given their consent, which occurred around midnight. The remaining Mercedes cars were discreetly pulled out of the race at 1.45am when the crowd was at its thinnest. They were first and third at that time. This was the worst accident in motorsports history. People tried to convince Jaguar to withdraw from the race as well, but it didn't end up happening. As it was, Hawthorne and his co-driver Ivor Webb won the race with a record average speed of 106 miles per hour. The race officials were overwhelmed by the disaster and they did not stop the race immediately. They feared that stopping the race would cause more confusion and hinder the rescue efforts. They also wanted to keep the track clear for ambulances and fire trucks. Fangio, who was driving close behind the V before the crash, barely escaped being a part of it. He later mentioned seeing a bright flash in his rearview mirror and hearing a loud noise. Instinctively, he hit the brakes and swerved right, narrowly missing Macklin's spinning car. He also witnessed Levy's car soaring over his head before landing ahead of him. Fangio managed to steer around it and keep racing. He believed that if Moss, his co-driver, hadn't warned him about Hawthorne's earlier pit stop, he might have crashed into Levy or Macklin too. Following the disaster, people spent days, weeks, and even months trying to figure out who was responsible. The official investigation didn't blame any drivers, but instead said the track was seriously unprepared for such high-speed racing. The track was of course built in 1923 for cars with a top speed of 60 miles per hour, but it had only seen minor updates since then, even though cars were now up to three times faster around the same track. Because of this tragic event, the Le Mans track was improved and the stand in the pit straight was taken down. Many countries in Europe banned motor racing right away until better safety standards were put in place. Switzerland still hasn't lifted its ban after Le Mans, at the end of that season, Macklin, Fitch, and some other drivers from the race decided to retire. Fangio never raced at Le Mans again, and Mercedes left motor racing completely until they came back in 1987, over 30 years later. But all these issues seem unimportant when you think about all the terrible things that happened that day in northwest France. The true impact of this disaster is that 84 people's lives were cut short. These were just people who wanted to enjoy their favourite sport on a sunny June afternoon.